All right, we are live on Facebook and YouTube, and I welcome you to the Moore Institute for Peace and Justice at St. Paul's College at the University of Manitoba. My name is Jason Brennan, and I'm the manager here at the uh, Morrow Institute. Which I have two different things going here. I'll turn off one of them. And uh, we welcome you today for the, the second of our alumni lectures. Uh, we, we welcome Dr. Kauser Ahmed today. Um, he has been uh, an alumnus of our, our institution from 2017. And over the course of the last three years, he's, uh, he's graced our, our, our brown bag lecture table with, uh, with updates and, and research into what's going on in Rakhine State and, and the, with the Rohingya people. And today he, he adds to that um, research by sharing and comparing, contrasting some, some different situations. Uh, one, of course, the Rohingya and one in, in, in the state of the DRC. And we'll hear from him today on that topic in, in due course. Um, I would like to begin, as, as we, we like to at the, the University of Manitoba, to recognize that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Brown Bay Lectures at the Moore Institute uh, are meant to bring together communities of scholars, but also members of the general community together to talk about issues of the day relating to peace and conflict studies. And so we're happy to do that today. Um, uh, because of our late start there, I apologize. We're just gonna, I'm gonna cut short a couple of things, but just hop right in. Uh, I will just have one opening remark that uh, uh, in the last week, there have been national elections that have caught the attention of people in the world. Uh, there's been one, uh, one that you might've heard of in the United States. Uh, but there was also one in Myanmar. Uh, it won't necessarily be the topic of discussion today, but it is interesting that uh, we're having this lecture uh, at the outset of their elections, which uh, the ruling party has declared themselves victors in, in, uh, in Myanmar. Uh, so, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, I am very happy to, to welcome my friend, Dr. Ahmed, but I'm going to ask uh, Charlotte Enns, our director of the Morrow Institute, to introduce uh, Dr. Kauser formally, and then we will uh, turn our attention to his lecture. Thank you very much, Jason. It's my uh, pleasure and honor to welcome and introduce Dr. Kauser Ahmed, who is an educator and researcher in peace and conflict studies, and who has in-depth understanding of social conflict and its peaceful transformation. While serving in the UN peacekeeping operations in conflict zones, he earned experience in peace building, mediation, and transformative dialogue in resolving intergroup conflict. He developed insights in conflict by studying social resistance, terrorism, and extremism in global and local contexts. He undertook several research studies on community focused conflict intervention, refugee crises, and youth extremism in Western and non-Western contexts. His publications encompass topics such as peace building, counter radicalization, economic aid and conflict intervention, national counter-terrorism strategies, and UN peacekeeping operations. He has a variety of research interests along these similar kinds of areas, conflict transformation and peace building, radicalization to violence, political violence, ideology driven extremism and community based intervention, external aid and peace building, military intervention and critical security studies, South and Southeast Asian security and migration and displacement related to conflict. He also serves as the executive director of the Conflict and Resilience Research Institute of Canada, or CRIC for short. CRIC is a Winnipeg based research organization which studies emerging social conflict issues associated with genocide, ethnocide, radicalization, human rights violation, statelessness and refuge, as well as resilience and evolving livelihood strategies of the victims of perpetration. The Morrow Institute was honored to partner with CRIC and the PAX program and Rotary World Peace Partners in hosting Professor Muhammad Yunus for a discussion uh, a couple of weeks ago. And that discussion was recorded and can be viewed on both the Morrow Institute and CRIC YouTube channels. Now, without any further ado, uh, Dr. Ahmed, welcome back to the Brown Le Bag Lecture Table. The table is yours. 
Thank you, Professor uh, Dr. Charlotte Enns and Moro Institute for Peace and Justice. Uh, it's, an, it's a distinct honor for me uh, to speak on uh, such occasions. I always feel very proud and connected with the Institute uh, because I was trained here. Uh, whatever skills I have gained uh, today, it is the direct contribution of my uh, supervisor, Dr. Sean Byrne and Jessica Senehi. I uh, profoundly uh, remember their uh, training and, and the spirit they have imbued, uh, which is uh, what I do uh, today. Um, thank you once again for the generous introduction of uh, uh, Conflict and Resilience Research Institute. Uh, where I, for, from I conduct uh, the current researches. Uh, today, uh, what I wanted to do is, as you see from the poster, is to compare uh, two cases, uh, very recent and ongoing cases of genocide. And the title of the talk is, as I framed, Unwanted People, Their Citizenship Struggles, Rohingyas and Banyamulangi. So uh, these are the two name of the uh, communities that we are going to talk about. And I have prepared a number of slides. I shall mostly uh, uh, restrict my discussions on the slides and explain some of the points. And at the end, hopefully we'll interact and clarify uh, if you have uh, questions. The scope of the presentation uh, is flashed on the screen. I would like to start uh, briefly uh, orienting you with both the communities and how they are facing uh, genocide cases. And I'd also talk about the differences and similarities of the cases. And uh, we'll spend some time outlining why these are called genocides. And also I would talk about how to prevent genocide in modern days. And finally, uh, and very briefly, I would also like to talk about our organization, Conflict and Resilience Research Institute. So um, I would like to first introduce uh, about the uh, community called Banya Mulenge in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. So here you see uh, two of the slides. And uh, before I uh, you know, proceed further, I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, the, uh, the issue of Banya Mulenge was uh, brought uh, to the attention and the collaboration that fostered in the aftermath between Conflict and Resilience Research Institute Canada and International uh, Social Studies Institute, uh, which is located in Rotterdam University at Hague. And uh, it is particularly um, uh, kind of initiated by a PhD candidate, Mr. Delphine Natanyame, and supported by uh, Professor Helen Hingen from the same university. So we jointly organized uh, a four part e seminar uh, that started uh, in October, end of October. Uh, and uh, we uh, organized four of them, and uh, thereby we came to know the details of the Bani Mulenge case, and, and that is why possibly today's lecture is uh, made possible. So um, back to this slide. Uh, here you see uh, the locations, geographic locations of the Bani Mulenge community. On to your left, you see uh, the exact location. Uh, this is uh, 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 you know interpreted in French. So. Uh, but you can understand that it has uh, an area of almost uh, over 23,000 uh, square kilometers. And the uh, Kivu area, as you see on the left, uh, encircled with red marking, is where uh, the Bani Mulenge community currently is located. And also in the southern Kivu area, as you see on to the right, uh, the yellow marking uh, shows a little bit of uh, expanded view of the place where uh, the the community of Bani Mulange currently uh, lives. A little bit of history because uh, in in many cases we don't uh, hear much about the Bani Mulange case in in in, in today's uh, uh, circumstances, and that is why I think it would be a little beneficial for our audience uh, to have a, a quick view about the cases and the vulnerabilities of the Bani Mulenge community. As you see on the screen, um, cattle herders and small community at the intersection of Fizi, Mwenge, and Uvira territories. If you go back to the uh, slide you'll, uh, of the map that I showed, uh, this is where uh, they are basically located and originated from Burundi, Rwanda, and Tanzania, and Uganda. 
and and it's linked to Tusi community as well in the Great Lakes region. And there is something called Bantu Nilotic or Tusi Hamitic hypothesis that figures out the uh, origin of Banyamulenge. And uh, Tusis are newcomers, hegemonic invaders. Uh, so these are the uh, kind of discourse uh, 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 sort of available with regards to Banyamulenge community. In this slide, uh, we are going on with the history as well. Um, we are talking about pre-colonial settlement in what it became Congo and systematically uh, Banyamulenge community is discriminated against uh, by the colonial administration. And as you know, uh, it was Belgium uh, who had colonized the whole part or most of the part of the Congo. And uh, through this colonial administration, what they did is they uh, abolished the Ottoman, uh, autonomous customary chieftains and chieftaincies of, uh, and that is how uh, the Bani Mulenge community became locally stateless. And here's a uh, list of um, other uh, ethnic uh, groups, uh, as you see on the bottom of the screen, the name of the groups, and they are all uh, live uh, you know, side by side in the same area. Um, traditionally, Chief Mahina uh, in 1924 is, uh, is thought to be the uh, early precursor of, of the Banya Mulenge's presence here. And post-independence violence, Banya Mulenge targeted as capitalists, and they were denied of their civic rights uh, in 1964, 72, 81, and finally 2006 because of unstable nationality laws. And uh, dear audience, please note this particular aspect, these nationality laws and how these are manipulated to, uh, you know, to disown a particular group of citizens within their own countries. And you will find sim I mean, the similarities of, of this aspect uh, with regards to Rohingyas as well. And uh, also uh, failed census to register Banya Mulanga's refugees happened in 1982. In 1987, Banya Mulange candidacy rejected as dubious nationality and they were excluded to attend sovereign national conference in 92-95. And uh, finally, in uh, Wangu Mabweni's commission resolved to expel Banya Mulange in December 1995. So through this historical description, you can see how an ethno-cultural group has been dispossessed and, uh, uh, you know, made uh, unwanted in their own place. And something uh, Mr. Delphine uh, Netanyoma, the PhD candidate uh, who uh, kindly allowed me to share his slides today with you, he said double victimization. So Banya Mulengas, uh, their grounded claims served as bridge to Great Lakes countries to wage wars in Congo and insurgencies and rebellions committed atrocities in uh, Congo. And of course, uh, you should remember the Rwanda Patriotic Front and Banya Mulenge, there is a link, and this is what he explained. Some Banya Mulenge youth joined RPF struggle and later Congo's insurgency, and some Banya Mulenge military opposed Rwandan-backed RCD in 2002 as well. And Rwanda-backed insurgency uh, sustained in that area between 2009 and 12. So uh, with regards to prior vulnerability as an ethnic group, and it is also coupled with the insurgencies and their perceived uh, uh, you know, participation in the violence made them double victim. And here I just uh, wanted to uh, summarize about the case of Banya Mulenge, their location and how they ended up being unwanted in their own territory. So as I said before, uh, they live in Eastern uh, Congo in South Kivu and the differences that has been uh, brought forward by, by the people around is uh, the term they call autochthonous, means indigenous. So Banya Mulengas are not considered to be indigenous. They are considered to be intruders coming from outside. And apparently, uh, uh, as, as you have uh, seen from uh, Mr. Delphine's slide, that Banya Mulengas involuntary involvement in armed insurgencies alongside Rwandan troops worsened their reputations. And this is how they became double victim, uh, I mean, victimized. And as well as radicalizing their uh, my, my opponents. So these armed groups now have uh, uh, taken up a cause to 
cause maximum destruction to the Bani Mulenge community there. The most recent confrontation have involved foreign armed groups from neighboring countries, including Burundians opposition groups. And this, is, uh, this has made the whole situation very precarious. Um, the genocide alert was based on the evidence of a series, serious intent to destroy villages and kill cattle so Bani Bulange can no longer occupy their few remaining localities and sustain themselves at all in their homeland areas of Minambue and Bijombo. And of course, local Mai Mai armed groups combined the surrounding Babambe, Baniundi, and Fuliro communities and are supported militarily and financially by Burundian opposition. And this is what has been reported from the ground. And regular and systematic attacks on the Bani Mulenge are justified by calling uh, these uh, citizens invaders and accusing of, uh, of them being outsiders. And between October 2018 and May 2019, narratives emerge in media and on social media that seem to uh, presage a rapid movement towards a real risk of genocide. So this is in general the situation uh, going on against the people of Bani Mulenge in South Kivu. I would end this part of the uh, case of, on Bani Mulenge just highlighting the uh, aspect that there is an ongoing United Nations peacekeeping mission uh, there and as you see from the slides, uh, this is one of the largest UN peacekeeping mission, field mission going on uh, with over 19,453 military personnel. And if you uh, can locate the locations of various uh, uh, aspects of this peace, peacekeeping operation, you can see uh, they are spread over many places. And uh, once you can uh, go to the mandate webpage of the United Nations mission in uh, Congo, which is in short called MONUSCO, you will find that one of the mandate is to protect civilians. And this is what we realized in our uh, four part E seminar that possibly United Nations mission is not equipped to protect a Bani Mulanges as it is expected. Now let's switch to Rohingya crisis at a glance. And in a, in, in a previous brown bag lecture, we presented uh, the initial stage of the genocide uh, and the displacement. Uh, today, I just uh, intend to uh, brief you about the updates about the uh, crisis and what we are actually uh, doing about it. Uh, so um, just a brief uh, uh, background again. Uh, uh, Myanmar is the most multicultural nation in the Southeast Asia, and it hosts more than 135 ethnocultural groups. Unfortunately, Rohingyas are not one of them listed and acknowledged by the state. So um, it is second largest ethnic minority. And if you follow my mouse, I'm not sure if it is visible there, but it, this is where is the Rakhine state of Myanmar and which is bordering Bangladesh here, as you see the Southeastern part of Bangladesh. And here it is India. So Rakhine state is located along these dotted lines. And mostly Rohingyas were located in the northwestern part of the Rakhine state uh, in, in, within Myanmar. Rohingyas became officially stateless in 1982 with the change of constitution. And uh, within a span of last uh, 50 years, we noticed three major exodus happened in 19, uh, started from 1978 1990 to 93, and finally 2017, August 25th. Uh, as of today, 1.3 million uh, Rohingyas are living in Bangladesh, southeastern part of Bangladesh. Again, as you see my mouse here, so pointer here. So they are living in the southeastern part in uh, refugee camps. And uh, in an estimate, roughly another million has been dispersed in uh, seven countries within Asia. Uh, uh, within, the, within the continent of Asia. And inside Rakhine, uh, there are as good as 600,000 of them are, are passing their days in a, in a, in a very uh, hostile situation inside the IDPs, internally displaced camps. And uh, but to a certain extent, uh, reports from uh, Medicines of Frontier and satellite images uh, captured by the researchers shows that most of the villages that the Rohingyas left or ousted from have been demolished and there is no 
a visible marker of the uh, original villages uh, where they can go back. At present, uh, with Bangladesh, China, and UHCR, there are a number of bi and trilateral treaties are in place uh, geared towards the repatriation of Rohingyas from Bangladesh. On the ground of accountability, uh, something uh, happened in the month of January this year, which is uh, significant in terms of uh, genocide and, and uh, its trial. As you see, International Court of Justice uh, just uh, passed an interim provisions to stop genocide. And uh, as you see on the, uh, in the, in the right-hand side of the slide, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, the Nobel Peace Laureate and de facto leader of Myanmar was presenting uh, on behalf of Myanmar uh, to disprove the case of genocide. And uh, what uh, International Court of Justice uh, actually proclaimed is, uh, as I said, it's a provisional order, but it is serving as a political catalyst for action for Rohingya activists, as well as uh, Rohingya crisis observers like us. And it ordered Myanmar not only to protect the Rohingyas against persecution, but also ordered Myanmar to preserve any evidence. And this is how Myanmar has directly been brought into the action. Uh, but with Myanmar pushing for the problems to be dealt internally as every state wants to deal with it, uh, international prosecution would only occur if the state itself was found to be instrumental in a genocide. So what happens is a two-step process after the provisional order, uh, the International Court of Justice will uh, reconvene at some point in the future. And if uh, they will try to find out if there was an intent of genocide. So uh, today I would also like to um, give you a, a broader picture why genocide happens. Because oftentimes we are somehow, those who research on genocide, and uh, crimes against humanity. We are stuck within a small space. We talk about victims, we talk about perpetrators, we talk about the tools used and how the, uh, or the, or the level of atrocities uh, claimed. But we often uh, somehow ignore the, the bigger picture uh, within which a genocide uh, uh, started to take shape. And uh, dear audience, once again, genocide doesn't happen within uh, 48 hours or uh, seven days. Uh, it, it, it takes place over a period of time, slowly, and, and often unnoticed, often unrecognized, and often unacknowledged. In the case of Rohingyas in Myanmar, we have seen, we have analyzed the UNHCR's, UNDP's report from the ground, which actually did not uh, flag any activities of Myanmar government in the initial years Sorry, I'm referring to 2012 and onwards. So this is why uh, it is probably necessary to understand that the geopolitical context within which it happens. For the case of Rohingyas, China's Belt and Road Initiative, and I'm not elaborating much on this whole aspect because it, it entails a long discussion about the Belt and Road Initiative, but just so that you know, uh, it's a huge initiative, strategic initiative, that China uh, unveiled in 2013, under which it wants to uh, build uh, and, and in fact revamp its Silk Road, its historic Silk Road, connecting most of the Central Asian nations and uh, eventually reaching Venice uh, and going over a number of European states. This is one arm of the Belt and Road Initiative. And the second arm is through the maritime route through the Indian Ocean. So when China unfolded uh, its strategic plan in 2013, we have realized that Myanmar plays a key hub within this whole initiative. And there is an economic power play involved in, in Myanmar uh, and, and mostly by India, China, and Japan. And I'll show you in details what they're doing uh, at this uh, uh, period of time. And, and possibly this is one of the reasons that uh, the Rohingya genocide, uh, you know, uh, kind of, and their expel ex expulsion from the land was expedited. In the meantime, it is also uh, uh, understandable that business as usual goes on. And because of the geopolitical context, <clears throat> in many cases, 
<coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> uh, pardon my uh, throat. <coughs> So uh, what I was trying to explain here uh, is that business as usual goes on uh, because of the geopolitical realities and the involvement of big powers actually inhibit uh, the intervention by international communities and the United Nations. For example, as, as the genocide is ongoing in uh, Myanmar, we still have a Canadian mining company operating in Myanmar. Of course, uh, the economic liberalization and the availability of enormous natural resources in Myanmar might have played uh, some role in the expulsion of uh, Rohingyas in 2017. Another uh, important aspect with regards to uh, Rohingyas in Rakhine uh, in, uh, in, in general and in a bigger perspective in Myanmar is that Myanmar is uh, suffering from ethnic armed insurgencies uh, since its inception in 1948. You can see uh, two uh, 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 maps that I have uh, brought out uh, so that you understand and you have a fair idea that all around its periphery, look at the right hand uh, map where um, uh, I have shown the flash, uh, you know, red flashes and you can see right from the uh, Rakhine state to the Chin state, to the Kachin, Shan and Kain and Tanian Thari, everywhere in the periphery, uh, there are armed insurgencies. And there are as good as 21 groups are vowing for power. And also they're opposing the state or the uh, uh, Myanmar military, often uh, known as Tatmadaw. And if you see on the left side, uh, the name of the groups, and there is a peace treaty uh, that the Myanmar government uh, uh, you know, introduced. And there are as good as three conferences have taken place. But overall, the, the situation is, is quite complex on ground and a number of armed uh, insurgent groups are operating in Myanmar. And that makes it really problematic for the international community to talk about repatriation because the state always gives an excuse that security situation is not good or, 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 or suitable for the protection of Rohingyas back to their villages. Most prolific is Arakan army and they are operating in the north part of Rakhine as of today and they have gained ground, they have gained power and they are pretty much uh, tech savvy and they have a website as you see. And, uh, and, and, and this group is quite, I mean, somewhat popular because they use the name Arakan Army. And uh, in, in our research, we have uh, seen that they do not associate uh, themselves with the Rohingyas or uh, Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, ARSA, is an offshoot of a militant group from the Rohingyas. They do not, uh, they do not really uh, explain any affiliation or coordination, uh, e even if they have something. So uh, just for your information that Arakan Army is the most prolific ethnic armed organization operating in the Northern Rakhine area as of today. So the China's involvement here, uh, that's what I wanted to show you in details because China uh, at this point in time is dominating in the Indian Ocean region. And if you follow the red line, you'll see uh, China wants to uh, you know, traffic its energy resources from uh, Middle East and Africa all through the Indian Ocean region and through Myanmar up to its Guangzhou province. So this is why it is very important that China controls the sea route which goes close to Myanmar. Here in this slide, you see a little a bit details of China's uh, basic plan of maritime sea route and uh, Myanmar plays a very important role, especially the Southern Rakhine. Uh, and, and I'm talking about this area. You will see uh, there is a deep seaport that China has already commissioned from where it uh, wishes to transport its energy uh, resources through pipeline. And uh, in this slide, uh, even more expanded view of China's ambition in this area uh, in the left, uh, uh, I mean, photo, you can see uh, in the inset uh, the gas fields and gas and pipeline that China has already 
built from Myanmar in the southern Rakhine state. And it is combined with the other pipelines that China uh, has already uh, commissioned in the Central Asian region. And to the right, it is again more detailed uh, uh, view of the uh, railway line and the gas and uh, pipeline that China, uh, I mean, as per our report, it is almost done uh, and is ready to transport. And uh, if you notice, Kiakfu is the deep support that China has recently commissioned, where it uh, wishes to transfer the energy resources coming from Africa and Middle East. India. So uh, as you understand uh, from my initial um, uh, uh, discussion that India is one of the regional powers in this area. And India is also not sitting tight. It has uh, commissioned its Kaladan multimodal transportation project. What it wishes to do is from its Calcutta port, as you see uh, here onto the left-hand side, and if you follow the uh, blue uh, line, it wants to transport its goods up to here in Sitwe and then transport it using the river Kaladan. And that is why the name of the project. And this whole Kaladan river flows through the Rakhine, Northern Rakhine state. And it wants to connect its landlocked, uh, one of the uh, seven uh, uh, Eastern regions, uh, which is kind of landlocked, as I said, is, is, is the state of Mizoram. So India has commissioned this project with, with another couple of billion dollars because it sees uh, that it's an opportunity to contest against China. And the audience, uh, just an additional information that uh, India and China is logged into an armed uh, conflict uh, just uh, over a month, uh, two months ago in the Galwan Valley uh, close to Tibet. So uh, India and China, uh, it, 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 it actually uh, rivals each other in, in this uh, part, part of the area and thereby they have a very legitimate interest strategically in Myanmar. Japan is the third largest country which uh, invested heavily uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in Myanmar and especially in the Rakhine area. It calls it special economic zone. And of course, Japan doesn't have military interest, but it has uh, established uh, a huge uh, zones for uh, processing of export goods. And this is why Japan has direct interest to secure it, its investment in Rakhine. And as I keep on expanding uh, the geopolitical, geoeconomic interest, in this slide, you can see the number of countries, as good as 10 countries, those who have invested so far in Myanmar. And this is a pretty much recent report only published in November uh, 2018. And you see China tops, but nonetheless, you have United Kingdom in here, you have Malaysia, and of course you have Netherlands. As Jason was hinting at in the beginning of the lecture that uh, Myanmar has just uh, uh, organized its second general election uh, on 8th of November. And I was uh, speaking in a session a uh, couple of uh, days ago in, in Bangladesh, uh, Center for Peace Studies, at North uh, South University. And we spoke quite uh, in details about the ramification of this general election. Nonetheless, this election is also very significant. And the way I wanted to frame here is that international community always suffer from a dilemma. And actually there are three dilemmas. One is liberal versus illiberal democracy, because we typically understand liberal democracy but uh, somewhat we, I mean, we don't understand what is illiberal democracy. And we, at some point, it seems that we have to really balance between these two sides of the democracy. Also, uh, from the Western side, we also uh, have to weigh between stability versus anarchy. And also, last but not the least, development versus underdevelopment. Myanmar is a classic case in this point because. At one point, European Union and others has given a green light of the election, but we all know that coming to the power of National League of Democracy, which is the largest uh, political party and own the majority in the last election, will not make much changes because it was, of course, since 1915, NLD was in power. But nonetheless, in this slide, uh, dear audience, have a look onto the six major 
political parties that participated in this election and NLD became or uh, achieved the majority in terms of parliament. And just so that you know, uh, by constitution in the parliament, uh, the military, Myanmar military reserves 25% of seats. So effectively, even if you have majority in the parla parliament, you cannot bring any changes with regards to ch uh, without changing the constitution. So this is what is the problem with regards to Myanmar uh, from the external side, because in, in on one hand, we want to see the transition to democracy and the democracy gaining ground in Myanmar. And on the other hand, we have to deal with the uh, major issues of genocide and crimes against humanity. So in this slide, I will quickly uh, tell you uh, that there are similarities uh, of both the cases that I spoke today, Bani Muleng and Rohingyas, because both of them started on the hills of decolonization. In, in Myanmar, uh, the British went off, and in, in Congo, the Belgium. Then state persecution of ethnic minorities are, are absolutely a common feature in both the cases. Majority versus minority polarization happened again in both the cases. And of course, systemic oppression by the states uh, uh, tantamount to genocide because uh, always genocide has an intention. And we see in both the cases, there is an intention of destroying a particular ethnocultural group. Displacement, rape, and assault were used as a tool of or tactics to threaten and, and, and expe expel the population from the places. And dehumanization through the hate speech was uh, very much available in both the cases. And finally, I think lack of will of regional powers to intervene uh, is also uh, very much uh, noticeable here. In, in the case of Myanmar, ASEAN is the regional uh, grouping that did not intervene uh, so far. And of course, in the Congo, uh, the African Union, uh, we have not seen any activities or initiative to deal with the situation. And of course, uh, always you will find that uh, internal security situation in both the cases are, are complex. And this is also used by the states to justify their uh, heavy handed security operations in those areas. In this slide, uh, you see the differences of, of, of these cases. In the Myanmar case, we find a very active involvement of uh, the Buddhist uh, radical uh, groups, which is called Mabatha, uh, faith groups. But in the case of Bani Mulenge, we don't see much. Um, in the case of Rohingyas, uh, the deliberate invol involvement of state military, but in the case of Bani Mulenge is not that deliberate. Uh, in the case of Bani Mulenge, we see United Nations is present on the ground with a fixed mandate but in the case of Myanmar is not. Ethnic armed insurgency is in a much smaller scale in Bani Mulenge case, whereas in Rohingya case, it is much more bigger in size and intensity. And Rohingyas were much integrated in Myanmar since 1948 as a minority. And even they contested in the parliamentary election until 2015. In, in the cases of Bani Mulenge, we don't see uh, much of uh, in integration in the political landscape of Congo. And of course, uh, Chinese involvement is not uh, uh, there in, in the case of Bani Mulenge, whereas in the Rohingya crisis, Chinese involvement is huge. And of course, there is no Nobel Peace Laureate uh, uh, that could have internationalized the issue as it happened with the Rohingya case. So uh, these are in general uh, my uh, discussions on both the cases with some details uh, so that uh, you understand the broader framework under which genocide has been perpetrated. Now I'll briefly talk about what does it take to prevent genocide or if it is happening to stop it. Very simply, absolutely in a simple terms, it takes tools and willingness. If these two are combined, then possibly something can be done. Just refresh your memories of the 1948 Genocide Convention. And I intentionally brought it up today for information because you see in Article 2, not one, in Article 2, the, the group uh, led by Mr. Lemkin 
highlighted five cause reasons of genocide, killing members of the group, causing bodily harm, deliberately inflicting conditions on one group, imposing measures to prevent birth and forcibly transferring children. So these are the you know, reasons for identifying a genocide. But look and read article one, and it says the contracting parties confirmed in 1948 or you know, afterwards those who signed uh, the convention that if genocide, whether committed in time of peace or in time of war, is a crime under international law, which they undertake to prevent and to punish. And this is phenomenal, that if according to article two, genocide is acknowledged, then go back to article one, it is moral obligation to prevent and to punish the perpetrator so that it doesn't happen again. And of course, Article 3 talks about genocide, conspiracy to commit genocide, direct and public incitement, attempt to commit and complicity. And hopefully ICJ is considering all these things, but nonetheless, these are very much prevalent in the cases of Bani Mulenge and Rohingyas. One of the last tool I would like to share with you is responsibility to protect. It is interesting to note that uh, R2P was generated uh, from Canada. And this is the Canadian uh, signature uh, protocol that has been adopted by the United Nations. However, the cornerstone of the problem is a balance between state sovereignty and humanitarian intervention. So it goes back to the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia when the state or national states were created and given the ultimate sovereignty to decide, uh, to decide and, and control uh, its citizens' fate. But in 1948, we came up with the Universal Declaration of the Human Rights and where we secured that whatever happens, the ultimate goal is to protect the human rights of people, not the state. And in 2000, year 2000, the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty was created because within this period, we have witnessed Rwanda, Balkans, Cambodia, Somalia, all genocide cases. And possibly this led to the discussion and creation of the commission in 2000, year 2000. Because at that time, the people are talking about uh, the, the point that state must not have the last say about uh, its sovereignty uh, when it uh, you know, compromises the security of its people. In 2005, at the UN World Summit, the General Assembly endorsed the responsibility to protect, and but it said, of course, case to case basis. Mind you, uh, dear audience, it is UN General Assembly, not UN Security Council. In uh, 2009, uh, UN Secretary General said, implementing the responsibility to protect, and he suggested that the R2P commitment should be brought forward. And in 2011, uh, there's something happened uh, from Brazil, and they spoke about responsibility while protecting, because it is often construed that R2P might be used for regime change. So in summary, we have tools in our, in our stock to deal with the genocide crimes against humanity. And these are the examples. In the Iraq case, uh, it's a, just a poster. And uh, also I wanted to show you that responsibility to protect is a formal tool and protocol which is available uh, at the UN. But there are five, they, what they call in case of Iraq war, what they did is they, they said five prudential criteria for possible intervention. And this is important because I wanted to uh, tell you that in order to stop genocide at this point, what you need. So look to the cases of Iraq. It says if atrocities justify a military response, the response has a primarily humanitarian motive. No lesser response is likely to be effective and response is proportional to the threat. And finally, intervention will be effective doing more good than harm. If these five criteria are met, 
Of course, intervention to stop further genocide is justified under international protocol. <clears throat> My, uh, uh, I think last slide here is, why never again is a redundant and quote unquote feel good idea? Because I think a victim who's, victimhood is always or sometimes measured in terms of quantity. If large number of people are not victim, then international community possibly uh, do not feel like to consider it as a, as, as, as a point of intervention. If major outbreak and hostilities disrupting world peace doesn't take place, possibly international community do not feel like to intervene. If geopolitics and geoeconomics of the area where from the people are evicted is, 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 is paramount, then possibly international community would not intervene. Major powers, I'm talking about UN Security Council members, permanent Security Council members, if they're unwilling, then intervention will not occur. If we think that state sovereignty is supreme and unviolable, then you cannot possibly intervene to stop genocide. International Court of Justice and International Criminal Court, they do, in terms, uh, they do work in terms of bringing state and people accountable, those who are committing or have committed uh, a war crime and a genocide. But uh, dear audience, it takes years and years 30, 40 years. Think about Cambodian war, uh, war, war uh, crime tribunal, how long it took. So although these uh, organizations are doing a fantastic job in holding people accountable and the state accountable, but within this period of 30, 40 years, the victims become further victims. And finally, national security always trumps uh, human rights violation in many cases. And this is why possibly we do say never again, but we again uh, get into uh, the, 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 the spectrum of, of genocide. Last but not the least, uh, our organizations, Conflict and Resilience Research Institute, uh, we study, uh, we research, uh, and we advocate for the protection of Rohingyas as of today. And uh, we are also uh, in the uh, education field because we think it is a peace building uh, tools uh, for the Rohingya children in the camps. Currently we are running two projects in the camps uh, for the adolescent females. And we also study and research statelessness and conflict arising therefrom. In the future, we have a plan to expand our research to, uh, and to include uh, other stateless groups uh, uh, such as the Palestinians, such as Kurds in the, in the Iraq areas, and, and of course, Romas in Italy and other areas, those who are currently stateless. And according to UNHCR report, it's more than uh, 12 to 13 million people are stateless uh, in, in today's world. Uh, from our platform, we conduct dialogue and uh, on conflict and resilience. We have conducted 20 uh, webinar series on COVID-19 acts its impact on conflict. And uh, four or five of them were uh, on Rohingya refugee crisis. And we also uh, uh, had a joint collaboration with the Rotterdam University uh, ISS. And uh, we have conducted uh, the research and uh, you know, a seminar on Bani Mulang and Rohingya cases. We talk about and we work on raising awareness on genocide prevention. And of course, we advocate uh, responsibility to, to protect, uh, to create a safe zone in Rakhine so that uh, Rohingyas can repatriate, go back to their uh, land uh, with dignity and safety. And of course, uh, please visit our website. You will find we offer practicum uh, training, uh, summer studentship and uh, internship uh, for the young people, those who are interested in conflict and genocide uh, and peace building. So I think I'll end here uh, and uh, floor is uh, back to Jason. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me. And it's, it's really uh, a unique opportunity to share our research with a broader audience. Thank you, Jason.
Thank you, Kauser. And uh, uh, just apologies again. We did start a little bit late because of technical reasons. So with uh, I'll indulge Kauser if you give us a few extra minutes, Kauser. Uh, I will open the floor to Q and A. Uh, we do have viewers on Facebook and YouTube. If there's any questions there, and I see that there already are, uh, I will turn to those as best we can. But if you want to raise your hand as an attendee in the Zoom meeting, I will be happy to recognize you and and uh, to to bring you into the conversation. Um, and we we can start. Uh, with a question coming from Facebook. So, Kaus, are you ready for that? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, the question is, uh, what are your thoughts on the use of Facebook to incite and, and Facebook's failure to prevent genocide in Myanmar? What were the experiences uh, over the last, uh, you know, since 2012 of social media and Facebook in particular that, that you know of? Uh, thank you very much for the question. I think uh, is uh, one of the uh, important questions in today's world. How do you uh, orchestrate a genocide or you know, uh, or, or let's say a riot, or let's say a revolution. So um, it's a very quick tool. And our research, uh, when we published our book, uh, as you have seen in the last slide, we have dedicated one chapter on social media and its role in inciting violence. And particularly uh, for the case of uh, Rohingya, uh, you know, uh, genocide and uh, their persecution, in 2012, uh, if you remember, some of you might, uh, there was a riot in, uh, in the city of Sitwe, uh, it's in the southern Rakhine state. And the whole riot actually was uh, organized, I mean, the news of the riot and uh, rumors were spread through Facebook and WhatsApp. And just because of rumor, uh, you know, over 600 Rohingya Muslims lost their lives and hundreds and thousands of businesses of Rohingya Muslims in all those small uh, townships were burned down because the rumor was a Rohingya uh, young uh, male has raped a Buddhist young female. So it is, it is, this is the uh, actual message that first popped out in the social media account. And on the one side, uh, the Buddhists uh, and, and, and in that area rallied their people and, uh, and mobilize them against the Rohingyas. And why uh, 2012? Because uh, if you also recall, in 2010, um, the year 2010, uh, there was an election, but not as good as 2015 or 2020, but still there was an election and there was a transition from uh, pure military autocracy to institutional democracy or whatever you may frame the uh, term. And at that time, Myanmar was opening up its spaces. I mean, both uh, in terms of internet and, of course, its uh, you know, physical spaces to from uh, <coughs> towards uh, from the external world. And at that time, uh, you know, the Facebook came in, internet came in, and people from Myanmar they always understood uh, internet as Facebook. So there was no differences between these two things, and and this is how it helped to organize the massive violence in 2012. And that is the only starting point. And we have followed uh, uh, the aftermath of the riot in uh, Sitwe in 2013 and, uh, and onward. And we have seen uh, the WhatsApp and Facebook actually played the most important role in, in getting people together against Rohingyas. And, and mind you, Rohingyas are already, they are the most marginalized groups uh, you know, uh, they did not have access to internet as the others had. Of course, th there's a segment of Rohingyas must have had access to internet. Uh, but majority wise, if you compare, the majority groups had more access to internet and they have used it in terms of. So um, there were a lot of, uh, you know, research done and uh, Facebook was definitely, uh, you know, later on took down number of sites. But uh, just to answer this question, yes, Facebook played uh, the major role in uh, organizing riot in 2012. Thank you, Kauser. I, I open the floor to other, other attendees or other people on Facebook. Any questions?
see none at the moment. I have one myself, uh, Kauser. Uh, you know, we talked about these elections and the election that just happened in 2020 and 2015. Uh, one of the aspects of your presentation was this comparison between uh, liberal and illiberal democracy. And um, could you expand on that? Because I think it's pretty central to anything you would want to implement, any of those remedies that you, you put on your final slides. Um, you know, how do they work in an illiberal democracy setting? So um, this particular term I borrowed from uh, Farid Zakaria's, uh, I think that he wrote a piece in foreign policy uh, years ago. Uh, the way he distinguished between these two form of democracy is that, well, in many of the um, you know, developing nations, those who came out of uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, military uh, rules and, and so on and so forth, they do started the, their journey in the path of democracy, but uh, they're still, uh, you know, is not the democracy that we see in our advanced, you know, you know, or, or the Western societies. So he kind of coined this term illiberal democracy in a sense that, well, uh, there is an election, of course, as a first step towards, you know, transitioning to democracy, because in a military ruled uh, situation, you do not have any uh, election or the staged election uh, at the most. So there is a semblance of, you know, uh, you know uh, process, if you, uh, if you tell the process wise, there is an election and there are a number of parties participating. And of course, within this participatory uh, matter, uh, it remains to be seen whether others could participate, whether it was an inclusive election or not. So that is another aspect within this participation matter. But nonetheless, you see a number of parties having their offices, banners, and you know, legitimacy participated. And one of the party got majority and their leader eventually uh, took over the state. So the process seems fine working. But at the back of this process, something is not working. And which is the institutions of democracies are not functioning, or this is not there at all. And this is what I meant uh, in terms of Myanmar, because since 2015, the first, uh, let's say the first uh, open uh, election where NLD led by Aung San Suu Kyi uh, came into power. So we all expected that um, she would do, uh, you know, or she would at least try to, or attempt to uh, establish the democratic institutions. You know, for example, election, uh, you know, free and fair election commission and, and the inclusion or inclusivity of other groups in the election process, which is not seen in the case of 2020. We all know that in 2020 election, under the same leadership, uh, Rohingyas could not participate. But in 2015, there were Rohingyas uh, allowed to participate in the election. But in, in 2020, it is absolutely no Rohingyas or no parties from Rohingyas. And also in 2020, uh, we have reports seen uh, coming out from Myanmar that uh, a number of ethnic uh, minority groups could not participate. And of course, the Rakhine, uh, state of Rakhine, the election commission of Myanmar canceled number of uh, voting uh, stations uh, because the security situation was not good. So, so this is the things that I, uh, I kind of uh, uh, tell them, uh, I mean, identify it as the acts of illiberal Democrats because uh, at that point, the institution does not function as we expect, as we see here, functions. Thank you, Kauser. Uh, Dr. Adams, I'm gonna promote you to panelist if you'd like to hop in and, and you have your hand up and then there's another question in the chat as well. Dr. Adams, I think you have to say yes that I, what did we lose him? No, no, I, I'm oh, here. There we, are. there we are. I there just we are. don't. I just don't have my camera for some reason working. But no worries. But anyway, we can I'm dressed you. properly in this in this photograph. So, uh, thanks very much, Kauser. Uh, I always appreciate the work that Crick is doing, and and uh, seeing your your the presentations by you and your colleagues, and the important work that you're doing. Uh, I did want to ask, though, uh, since you're just talking about elections, I'm wondering if you see any impact of the outcome of the American election and uh, the, the hopeful demise of, of uh, Donald Trump is having any impact on the, on, on, uh, the Rohingya crisis. Well, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Christopher Adams. And actually, uh, dear audience, uh, uh, we are uh, super grateful 
because uh, we are housed uh, in St. Paul's and uh, uh, St. Paul's always supports uh, clicks activities. So uh, I had to you know, uh, share this one before I actually answer uh, 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 Chris's point. So yes, um, we, we expect that the change of uh, US uh, uh, politics would bring uh, fresh air into the Indian Ocean region. But um, uh, Chris, I would like to uh, you know, uh, uh, explain uh, the possible ramification of US election in, in two ways. First, uh, I would like to see that the new US administration engages in the Indian uh, Ocean region actively because over the past four years during the Trump uh, you know, regime, we have not seen any involvement of Americans in the whole area itself. When China actually advanced its uh, you know, BRIs and it established its, you know, all the stations and, uh, and it kind of finalized its whole BRI project. So in terms of engaging uh, China in the Indian Ocean region, I, I would like to uh, see and hope that uh, America takes it seriously and re-engages itself in this area. And secondly, uh, Chris, I would like to uh, uh, see Americans uh, re-evaluate their posture in Myanmar, because uh, if you remember, uh, Chris, in 2015, Barack Obama's administration, when Suki came into power with landslide victory, like this year, Barack Obama's administration rushed in I use the word rushed in and took all these sanctions off uh, very rapidly within a span of six to eight months. And what happened through this lifting of sanctions, because as you know, in Myanmar, there are a there are number of military-backed companies, multinational corporations are operating. They again started operating. And you know, as a result, I know it is all about military, back to this same, same scene. So I would like to, um, uh, you know, uh, tell my American friends that please re-engage with, with, with a caution because uh, American engagement in Myanmar only for geopolitical reason is not enough because what is going to unfold in next couple of years in Myanmar, we have a fair idea. Rohingya crisis is not going to be resolved. No Rohingyas will be repatriated. That is our fair assumption as a researcher under the current situation. So this is why we would like to tell our American friends that please re-engage because uh, of, of the Chinese influence in Indian Ocean region. But when you talk about, think about Myanmar and sanctions and support, please think twice, how do you want to do that? Thank you. Thanks very much, Kauser. Thank you, Kauser. And would you have one other question? Maybe it'll be our last question of the day. And, uh, uh, you know, in South Asia, we're uh, familiar with uh, the concept of caste system. And, and so the question is, 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 is that playing a role at all in, in their marginalization and in, in the history of, of what's going on in, in that part of the world? In Myanmar, no. In Myanmar, uh, like um, uh, in India, we have a caste system, as we all know. But in Myanmar, actually, um, the majority are Bamar, and they are uh, they follow Theravada tradition of Buddhism. So, in Theravada tradition of Buddhism, I'm not going into that details, but uh, the strict caste system is not there. What is prevailing in Myanmar, and uh, which kind of caused uh, a lot of uh, problem with regards to uh, Rohingyas being persecuted, is a radical wing of uh, of, of the uh, of the Buddhist community led by Ashin Virathu. And their initial name of the movement was Mahabatha. Uh, and it is purely uh, construed on the idea or perception of saving race and their, uh, their nation. So a part of that uh, you know, extreme radical right group uh, within the Buddhist uh, community, uh, they created a huge uh, you know, uh, atmosphere of propaganda and uh, that acted against uh, Rohingyas. And in fact, Rohingyas uh, uh, particularly, but in general against all Muslims in Myanmar. So this is what happened, but caste system uh, is not actually there. And last but not the least, um, I would like to say that in Myanmar, the ethnic minorities are quite large a group, around 30% of total population. And as you have, uh, if you can recall the maps and all, they are mostly living in the periphery of the countries, 
of the country. So uh, the, uh, the mayor being there, they are already isolated. And this is how uh, through the constitutional changes and the military rule from 1962, they have been persecuted. But, it, but in the overall makeup of the genocide and the armed conflict, whatever you see there, caste system has nothing to do. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Kauser. Uh, uh, we'll bring it to a close now, but I just want to thank you again. Uh, we're happy that we were able to record this. We're happy we had some viewers on Facebook and YouTube Live uh, because you, you've given lectures in the past that are just so dense and so rich with, with an understanding of all the steps that take to get us to today. Uh, and and we, were, we didn't record those ones, but this one's recorded, so that's great. Uh, Dr. Enza, if you can, I'll just ask you to bring us to a close today, and I thank all of our attendees and, and, and viewers. Thanks, Jason, and thank you so much, Kauser, Dr. Ahmed. We really uh, appreciate your time, your expertise, and the amazing insights that you bring to these stories and uh, situations that, uh, that affect so many people. And we thank you for your work, and we thank you for sharing it with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is, it is a real pleasure. Thank you so much, Professor Anne. Thank you, my friend, uh, Dr. Ahmed. We'll bring it to a close and, and uh, join us next week. Uh, Bob Christmas uh, will will be uh, another alumnus coming to do another brown bag lecture next Friday at 1130 at Thanks. the Morrow Institute. Thanks, Kauser. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Take care, everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Bye. -bye.